Good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Just if you haven't heard, Purdue lost. I will be standing at the back of the auditorium to take the insults and the comments, just so you know. I'm fully prepared for it. I got two text messages last night, the night they lost, from people at work giving me a hard time, so I'm fully prepared. I saw a thing on, the, on social media. Somebody commented and said, yeah, I can't believe they, they lost. And they said, wait a minute. I don't watch basketball. I watch a real sport, hockey. And I looked to see if it was the pastor. So um, anyway, um, you know, one place that we should be able to have fun is church. We should be the happiest people in the world because we know how it ends. So let's be happy today and let's enjoy church. Okay. Um, Let's get on with the announcement. It says, thanks to all who came for the work day. Uh, if you go back into the fellowship hall, there's a table with a bunch of free stuff on it. Uh, I imagine that'll sit there for maybe till, maybe till next Sunday before it finds a home, which would either be Goodwill or the Hopper. So, um, so please uh, go back there and avail yourself of that. And uh, let's, let's try to get that cleaned up as soon as we can. Uh, and I think... That is all of the announcements. So this morning I was sitting in my chair getting ready for Sunday school and my, my mom came up and said, and she read me this verse. And I'm like, mom, why are you reading me that verse? And she said, well, I thought you could use it this morning. So this comes from my mother. Um, John 13, verse seven. Jesus and answered and said unto him, what do thou knowest not, what, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. What God is doing in our lives now, we might not understand why he's doing it. We just might not. But you want to know something? One of these days we will. I can only speak from personal experience, but I look back on the arc of my life. And when some of the times it was just, I didn't know why God was doing what he was doing. And then now, 10 years, I can look back and I can say, God was working in my life. God was doing what was best for me. Even though it was hard and even though I was grouchy. God was preparing me for something better in my life. So just remember that the next time you're going through something, we don't know why we're going through it, but God does, and he is preparing us for something. Amen. So let's stand and, be, and open in a word of prayer, and please remain standing um, for, the, uh, for the opening, for the first song. Brother Merlin, will you open us in prayer, please? Amen. Take your hymnals, number 49. 49, blessed be the name. 49. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die, that he might man redeem. Oh. 
above. A prince of peace, of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, who reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Number 56, to God be the glory, 5-6. Uh, we got a wrong number there. What is it? 52, thank you. To God be the glory, number 52. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who done in himself an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of God, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing to Jesus the Son. The purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. You may be seated, number 50, back to hymns, number 50, Jesus, Wonderful Lord, <clears throat> number 50. Born among cattle in poverty sore, living in meekness on Galilee's shore, dying in shame as the wicked once swore, Jesus, wonderful Lord. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, He's my friend. True to the end, he gave himself to redeem me, Jesus, wonderful Lord. Weary yet, he is the world's only rest. Hungry and thirsty, yet plenty has blessed. Tempted, he promises grace for each test. Jesus, wonderful Lord, wonderful, wonderful Jesus, he is my friend, true to the end, he gave himself to redeem me, Jesus, wonderful Lord, friend of the friendless, betrayed and denied, help of the weak in Gethsemane tried, 
light of the world in gross darkness he died jesus wonderful lord wonderful wonderful jesus he is my friend true to the end he gave himself to beautiful contrasts in there, isn't there? Hungry, yet he is, and thirsty, and plenty is blessed. Weary, yet he is the world's only rest. Amen. Back to number eight. Back to number eight. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Number eight. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light. Verse number three. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depths of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who love and love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the Join the happy chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward. Victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song. Good singing this morning. We do have a special this morning. Mike and I picked a short straw. No other song have I but that of Jesus, the Son of God, who came to seek and save, who paid the price for pardon and redemption. When on the cross his life he freely Stained with his own blood 
Brother Mike. Job chapter 1 this morning. Job chapter 1. Dealing with different aspects and avenues of this story. There's so many themes that are interlocked and intertwined. In, in these first two chapters. And so, uh, dealing with why, a few weeks ago, why things happen that seem unfair. Uh, last week, dealing with uh, basically the character of the devil. And this week, more to the proper response, the godly response when we go through pain and loss. Job chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse number 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabines fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Last week we read the account of, of Satan talking to God. So let's uh, drop down to verse number 7. So, when, uh, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for... 
your word and how it speaks directly to us. Lord, there's things that we're going through today that this passage could be written for us today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would meet us, fill us, convict us, keep us. Be with us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says, The thief, speaking of the devil, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I don't suppose that there is any more dramatic revelation of this truth anywhere in the scripture than right here in the first two chapters of Job. The thief cometh not, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Marauding tribes came at the instigation of the devils and, and they stole Job's livestock. What we would call natural disaster uh, struck and destroyed uh, uh, 7,000 of his sheep with the servants and then 10 of, of his children, all of his children. And then a horrible disease stole his health, leaving him wishing he would just die. Now this leaves us with a lot of questions. Is the devil behind every natural disaster? Is the devil behind every disease? Is, you know, we often hear people referring to natural disasters as acts of God. And uh, interestingly enough, they refer to them here as an act of God. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and uh, consumed the servants and the sheep. Um, is, is, uh, is the devil to blame for uh, acts of theft or, or terrorism? Uh, does he provoke robbers? Uh, is disease an attack upon the devil? And of course, the blanket answer to all that is no, don't ascribe more power to the devil than he has. He's very, he's actually a weakling. But it obviously can be because here it was. If you and I were to research a book in the Bible where we would find all kinds of questions, we would find that there is one book in the Bible that has over twice the questions in it than any other book of the Bible. That's the book of Job. Genesis has, I'm told, 160 questions in it in total, 50 chapters. Matthew has 180 uh, questions in it in 28 chapters. Um, Psalms, 150 Psalms, there's only 160 questions. But with Job, 42, que 42 uh, chapters, there's over 330 questions. Why is that? Because in the time of, of pain and loss, in the time of, of, of attack and persecution, questions come up. In a time of suffering, in a time of, of pain, we get all kinds of questions like that, and, and the, uh, the, the, the theme or the overarching thing that we see in the book of Job is tragedy, loss, suffering, pain, death. And so we have all kinds of questions. Job lost all of his businesses. He had several businesses. He had several avenues. He lost all of his profits. He lost his servant, his servants. He had a very large household of servants. He lost his children. He, he lost all of that in one day, probably in the, in, in the space of less than a half an hour. This was quite an organized attack by the devil. I mean, the Chaldeans had to come 700 miles across country, and they came within seconds of all of these other things that happened. He lost it all. And then in chapter 2, we see he loses his health. He loses uh, the, the support of his wife. He loses the respect of his friends. He loses the respect of his community. In fact, is in Job chapter 29, it says, and this is Job speaking, I was eyes to the blind and feet to that, 
uh, and feet I was to the blame, to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not I searched out. But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. He, he had lost respect in the community. He said, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't allow them to sit with the dogs in my flock before, and now they're looking down on me. A few weeks ago, we looked at why do the godly suffer. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Last week, we looked at the character of the devil, and, and uh, while all these subjects interlock, we see this week Job's God-honoring response, even in the midst of undue uh, trials, even in the midst of, of undue, unfair, uh, hurtful, destructive circumstances, he didn't understand what was going on any more than we understand what is going on many times. Brother Andy kind of brought that out in uh, the verse that he read, it just goes right along with this, with this message. He didn't understand it at the time any more than we do when we're going through. And there are people here who have lost children. There are people here who have, who have, have lost a spouse, who have, who have lost their parents at a very young age, who have been abused and suffered from chronic ill health and, and uh, horrible disease and suffered huge financial losses from doing the right thing and following honorable principles and uh, many of these things that uh, Job went through as well. And no doubt many of them are direct attacks of the devil. Though we were probably won't know this side of heaven. So I want to consider this morning what should our response be? And there's different avenues that we need to look at this morning. But what should our response be? That's really what I want to finish with. Job's wife, I'm, I'm not sure from this text whether she was a discouraged believer or whether she just didn't share uh, the belief of Job, uh, his convictions at this point. But she asks a question that many unsaved and many carnal Christians ask too. Dost thou still... Uh, dost thou still Retain, that's the word I'm looking for. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Dost thou still retain thy integrity? See, that's the devil's goal. Curse God and die. That's what he wants for every person that's ever born. In other words, she's saying, how can you still believe, Job? How can you still preach, preacher? The love of God. How can you still believe that God cares for you? Look at all the bad things that has happened. How can you still believe when you're standing beside the grave of your children that, that God still loves and cares for you? How can you still believe when you're huddled in your basement as a, a tornado rips through your property and knocks down a house where your children are? How can you still believe? How can you still believe when you're in, in our uh, day and age, when you're lying in the hospital and you can't get comfortable because you're, the, your, your body is in such pain and, and awful torment? How can you still believe? And Job's response is lovely. Job's response is essentially, I couldn't do it without God. I, I couldn't get through it if I didn't have God. I couldn't endure these losses. It would overcome me. I couldn't endure these attacks of the devil if it were not for my faith in God. And he gave thanks for God to God for the good things. But notice he didn't blame God for the evil things. He, he said, shall we not receive good at the hand of God? But he didn't say that evil came at the hand of God. He said, and shall we not receive evil? James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
Do you know what the, the, the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, Pastor James, is saying? He's saying, if God has called you to suffer some persecution, if God has called you to go through some difficulty, it, it is because he sees some faith in you that he wants strengthened. He wants your faith strengthened. Let me ask you, who does the hospital call when they get a, a medical case that nobody else can solve? They call their best surgeon. Who, who does the service manager call when, it, when a prominent person comes in and he's got a, a, a problem with his car that none of the other mechanic shops can fix? He calls his best mechanic. Who, who is it that the police chief calls on when there's a situation so volatile in the community that it has to be dealt with right? The best of the best, the SWAT team. Who, who is it that the coach calls on when the clock stops and they have 1.5 seconds to go on the clock? The best player. That's who God calls. Or that's who, that, that's who they call. And there is sweat pouring off of their forehead because of the high pressure, high tense situation. There is beads of sweat coming off of the surgeon's head, not because he is toiling and using his muscles, but because of the pressure upon him. He needs to find this out and he has 10 minutes to do it. And what Job's wife is saying and what pretty much anybody in the world will say is, curse and walk away. But let me tell you, wouldn't do the surgeon, uh, that, that person, any good if the surgeon curses and walks away. It wouldn't do the community any good if the SWAT team curses and walks away. It wouldn't do the team any good if that player curses the coach and walks away. James says, count it all joy because God sees faith in you that is able to handle this situation and he's going to give you strength to get through it. He's going to give you wisdom and, and, and to get through it. Most often, the first reaction when tragedy strikes is denial. Now, psychologists will say that denial is the first of five stages of grief. I don't know what those five stages are off the, the top of my head, but they say that 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 is the first uh, of five stages of grief. That's the, the, often the first reaction when tragedy strikes. No, 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 no. No, this stuff doesn't happen to me. This stuff doesn't happen to God, to, to, to us. God, you've made a mistake. God, uh, this is stuff we read about. This is stuff that happens to other people. Uh, we don't go through things like this. Uh, we help other people go through things like this. Denial. And sad to say, this is where the devil so often gets us to reject God. This is, this, this is where the devil gets us to reject God by saying, how could a God of love, how could a God who knows everything, how could a God who is all-powerful allow evil to exist? Now, if you stop with that, it sounds logical and you will fall right into the landslide where the devil wants you, along with a lot of other people. I'm going to mention a name, and I'm not promoting him, but I, I, uh, I do want to give honor where honor is due. John MacArthur. He's been interviewed many times on Larry King, including, I think the first time was right after the Twin Towers fell. And uh, he stated that the single question that Larry King always went back to was this one. If God is all loving, if God is, is, is all knowing, why is there evil? And, it, and really the logic that goes, goes like this, and it's Larry King's or it's somebody else's, it, it, it's all pretty much the same. The logic goes like this. The God that the Bible talks about is loving. The God that the Bible talks about is all-powerful. The God that the Bible talks about is all-knowing. Uh, he is righteous, and yet massive evil exists. Therefore, okay, we're drawing a conclusion. 
The God of the Bible does not exist. That's the logic where the devil would have you go. And if he can get you to stop thinking there, he's got you. In other words, anyone who would allow this kind of evil and suffering cannot be loving, cannot be righteous, cannot be powerful, cannot be all-knowing. And that backs so many of us Christians into a really uncomfortable corner that we really don't know how to answer. I've been backed into that corner many times and, and, and stumbled around for an answer. And, you, and I've said things like, well, it wasn't God's fault, it's the devil's. That's true, but that trails right back to the uh, question, if God is all-knowing, then why did he create the devil? Well, it's not God's fault, it's Adam and Eve. They, they, they disobeyed, which trails right back to God, if you follow it through, which most people will. And so it, it always comes back to God, and we end up quoting uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. God doesn't answer to me, and so uh, leave it in God's lap and walk away. And that's really not a satisfactory answer, although it is true. But we see here in the book of Job, Job doesn't ever put God on trial. He never says, if God were good, this wouldn't have happened to me. Job puts himself on trial. He says, naked was I when I came into this world. Naked, I'm going to go out. He says, uh, the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. What's my conclusion? Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the conclusion that Job came up with. He's saying, nothing in this earth belongs to me. I can't take it with me, not even my clothes. Even my very life is in God's hand. He gave it to me, and he'll take it away. It's up to him to take it when he chooses and as he chooses. And if I'm going to get through this trial that I'm going through, I have to rely on the blessedness and goodness of God. I mentioned that uh, John MacArthur was on Larry King right after uh, the Twin Towers went down in 9-11. And uh, Larry King asked John MacArthur, what is the lesson of 9-11? What is the lesson of 9-11? And he said this, the lesson is, you're going to die and you're not in charge of when or how. He said everybody who died in the Twin Towers was going to die anyway. So you need to be ready today. What a message for Larry King. What a message for everybody who is listening. He said, everybody is living on borrowed time because the wages of sin, get this, is death. It is death. And the soul that sins, it will die. And you will all die. The truth is, we all are going to die, and you know, we get so consumed with the things that we can accumulate and the things that we can get and the things, and, and living our life to its potential today that we lose sight of the real reason that we're here, to prepare for eternity, to bring others to eternity with us. And as we look at some of the things that happened to Job and try to relate to today, I want us to see one thing that kept Job going through it all. And you're probably going to raise your eyebrows when I say this, but it's there. Hope. The only thing that kept Job going was hope. It was hope in God. When you lose hope, when people lose hope, when people lose hope that there is a God, and by hope I don't mean a maybe there's a God, I mean the, the, the expectancy that there is. Then there's no more reason to live. Job said in Job chapter 14 and verse 7, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. He had hope, even though he was cut down to the ground. 
People cannot live without hope. If you remember Dr. Strange when he was here, he, he said, I have a tract I always keep, and it says hope. And I say to people, can I give you a little hope? And, you know, even if we don't talk about eternal hope, people cannot live without hope. Hope of a better day than I had yesterday. Ho hope of a better week than I had last week. Um, people commit suicide when they lose hope. That's the reason th that they commit suicide. The sad thing is about that, after death, there is no hope unless you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who the Apostle Paul calls our blessed hope. There is no hope without the blessed hope, either in this life or the next. The devil wants us to live in fear. You know what fear is? No hope. No hope. That's where he tried to take Job. Job wasn't going to go with him. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's where I'm going to stay. Now, Job had three things that happened to him. There's still a problem today. We can label them uh, in different ways, but um, we'll label them this way. Terrorism. It's a term that we know today. Resulting in the deaths of many and the thefts of hundreds of maybe probably $100 million worth in today's money in livestock natural disaster, and debilitating disease. Terrorism. Verse number 15 of chapter 1, we see the Sabines. The Sabines were a, a, a Arabian tribe in northern Arabia that came down and uh, killed the servants except for one, took the 500 yoke of oxen that were, were plowing in the fields, um, assumed that there was at least one servant with each of them, although sometimes you see... Uh, a servant in, in front and, and behind when they're dealing with, with oxen. But um, then there's 500 female donkeys. Verse number 17, the Chaldeans came all the way from Babylon and they killed the servants and took 3,000 camels. When we think of terrorist attack, we immediately think of the Twin Towers where approximately 3,000 lives were lost and... I think I read somewhere around $35 billion in revenue was lost. What is the question that is always asked? Where is God? We see in Job's life natural disaster. Lightning, here called the fire of God, fell and killed 7,000 sheep. And the servants that were tending them and left only one servant alive. You know, I was in a, uh, a home this week of a couple, and on their wall was a, a plaque, and it said, Our marriage was made in heaven, but then again, so was lightning and thunder. <laughs> I just uh, was thinking about that when I was mentioning this lightning. I had to share that. Be that as it may. Uh, that must have been quite a uh, fireworks show here uh, for, for 7,000 sheep, and the and the, uh, the, the servants that went along with that to, to die. And then we have, in verse number 19, uh, a, a storm, maybe a tornado, maybe something that I don't know about that's a Middle Eastern storm came up and, uh, and smote the house and killed the, the people. And people like uh, Job's children and people like Larry King asked this same question. Where's God? If you believe in God, where is the love of God in all of this? Most of you can remember very clearly the tsunami back in 2004 in India. Um, I believe the death toll, or at least the missing and the death toll, was 225,000 people. And, and, and what's going on here, the 1st of March over in Syria and Turkey... Now, maybe that's not quite as much in our sights because they're a different people. They worship a different God and they, they think differently. And maybe sometimes we re relegate that to the judgment of God. But God loves every one of those souls. Over 50,000 died in those earthquakes. Let's get some perspective over in Luke chapter 13. 
Luke chapter 13, Jesus gives us some perspective here. In Luke chapter 13, in verse number 1, he says, There were present at, the se at, at that season some that told him, that's Jesus, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell, and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus is saying, basically, you're all going to die, and you're not in charge of when or how it's going to happen. You better be ready. Are you ready for eternity? And then in verses 6 through 10, we're not going to read it here, but it's the parable of the fig tree um, where the, uh, the man comes year after year, and he's seeking the fruit off of the fig tree, and he finds none. And so he tells the dresser to cut it down. And the principle that Jesus is teaching here is we're, we're living on borrowed time. You're, you're living on the grace and mercy of, of the one who owns you, the one who made you. And, and he's basically saying every day is an opportunity to get right with God. Every day is an opportunity to bear fruit for God. But if God, if we will not, if God comes and he sees no fruit year after year, it gives him no reason to extend his mercy and grace. Turn back one chapter, chapter 12 and verse number 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you to uh, whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And so we have natural disaster that happens in our lives. And, and we, we question. And thirdly, we see personal disease. Chapter 2 and verse 7. Going back to Job. Chapter 2 and verse number 7. Satan smote Job with sore boils. From the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And I'm not sure exactly what we would call this in medical terms. But we know that, that he couldn't sit down without pain. And he couldn't stand up without pain. He couldn't kneel down without pain. He couldn't go on all fours without pain. There was no position that he could get into that it wasn't excruciating pain. It was from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Immense pain. And there was times that he felt like he was going to die, and there was times that he wished he would die. And we still have all three of these problems. Theft, terrorism, natural disaster, disease that affects our lives, and they still cause God, uh, they, they, they still cause people to curse God and wish for death, give up hope. Now, we're going to try to find an answer here so that we can help not only ourselves, but others who are going through hard times. Or at least, like Mary and Martha that we looked at a couple weeks ago, don't understand why God didn't answer the way they wanted to or didn't prevent it. But I want to see once again that the answer, and this has been the theme as we've been looking in the book of Job, the answer to the questions and the answer to the problems are found in Jesus Christ. The answer is found in Jesus Christ. So I want to consider a few things as we try to pick up this logic and uh, that, that so many people are swept aside with and, and, and diffuse it. Number one, evil does exist. Evil is real. Okay, we, we need to admit that. We can't be like the Christian scientists and say it doesn't exist. Um, it, it, it is a reality. There's, there's um, natural evil, evil in nature that came as a result of the curse. There's killing and there's, and there's uh, predatory um, instincts and things die. There's moral evil, a, a natural tendency to sin, a sin nature. Job said... In, in chapter 5, 
Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. David said in, in, in Psalm 14, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then, thirdly, there is a spiritual or a supernatural evil, and that is an evil that is perpetrated by Satan and his angels. We dealt with that a little bit last week. 1 John 5 says, The whole world lieth in wickedness. Secondly, and maybe I should have put this one first, God exists. There's so many avenues that we could look at for this. Uh, David said, The heavens declare the glory of God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 we see that creation declares the existence of God. The Bible declares the existence of God. And uh, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Either... Uh, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Stuttering a little bit here as I try to get through uh, this uh, material before I uh, run out of time. Uh, thirdly, I want us to see God allows evil to exist. Now, this is where we lose John MacArthur. Uh, this is, in fact, is I'll, I'll give you a quote that he said. He said, God wills evil to exist. In other words, he created it. And um, he, he says, uh, God takes full responsibility for the existence of evil unfolding in this world. That's not true. God allows evil to exist. And you know, um, he'll, uh, they'll, I'll say they, they'll cite verses like uh, Isaiah 45, 7 that says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, okay? There the verse says, I create evil. Well, so there we go to that verse, God created evil. No, let's put that verse in context and not exclude it and pull it out of its context. It says that he forms light and creates uh, evil, I mean, um, creates darkness, okay? So God formed the light, and even though it pained him, he creates the absence of light, which is darkness. And in the, the same line of thinking, he made peace. And though it pains him, he created the punishment for those who reject the peace, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He made a punishment. In other words, he made evil. He made a punishment which God does not love. He does not love punishing. But he made that evil. He made the punishment for those who who reject the Prince of Peace. And so this verse is not saying that God created wickedness. It's saying he created a punishment for those who reject his son. And, uh, but God did create creatures with a free will. And as part of that came into the world a potential for evil. Now follow with me because if you get nothing else, I want you to get this. The next question inevitably will be, why did God allow man to have a free will? And why did he allow the devil to have a choice if he uh, knew what the decision would be? Now, we need to understand something. And this is really the pivotal point of the argument uh, of the logic that we looked at before. This is really the pivotal point. You cannot have true freedom. You cannot have true free will unless there is a choice to be had. You can't. You cannot be truly free if you don't have a choice. You can't say you have the freedom of choice, but you can't choose that. Let me tell you something. That's the devil's system. That's communism. You have the freedom to choose if you choose me. That's the devil's system. There is no choice in that. But God, because he, he, he loves us, gave us a genuine choice. You cannot have genuine freedom unless there is a potential to sin. 
And if you don't have free will, then you don't have love because love requires a choice. And if you don't have love, which in 1 John tells us is an attribute of God, then you don't have a good God. You follow with me? If you don't have choice, if you don't have choice to potentially sin, not that God wants you to, then you don't truly have free will. So God, because of his love for man and his desire for man to choose to love him, not be forced, created us with the ability to choose evil and good. And the problem is we choose evil more often than good. You know, I think of the Garden of Eden and and all of the good things that God put over acres and acres and acres. And I can imagine this this scraggly, homely tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they walked by without even looking at for most of the time until the devil got them looking at it. God tried to make it easy for them to choose good. They only had one unattractive choice of evil. And yet that's what they chose. And I want to bring this to a real poignant close, not the, the message, but this point with this. People who point fingers at God and blame him for not loving and and, and caring give no consideration to the cost that that choice cost him. He followed through with it even though he knew he would suffer more than any man, any man, even Job. Because he chose to give us a choice, it cost him everything. Sometimes we talk about necessary evils as things that we have to go through in order to have some certain income. The only, or not income, but uh, outcome. um, But the only necessary evil that ever existed on this earth was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way God could deal with the problem of evil and still allow us a free will to choose to love him was to send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And number four, even though evil exists, God's purposes are perfectly fulfilled even for those who choose to love him. I think Joy brought this out in her testimony in Sunday school. Evil always does harm and and ends in death to those who have refused the Lord Jesus Christ. It always does. The devil always brings to the conclusion fear and, and despair and death. That's the end of the unsaved. But for those who love the Lord, his death and resurrection turned every evil that the devil could do into good for them that love him. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for them, uh, to good for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We look at circumstances like Job's, and, and and we say how awful that he had to go through that. And God says, I saw that it would work together for good. Uh, Satan meant it for, for evil, but I, I intended to turn that around, and I saw that it would strengthen his faith, and I saw that he would come out with a greater testimony, and I saw that he would have a greater love, and I saw that there would be greater blessing, and so I allowed him to go through with that. God turns Satan's evil around, and he makes it for good in our lives. What about the worst thing that happened to Jesus Christ? The worst thing that could have happened to this world is the death of God. The death of Jesus Christ. And yet God turned it around for what? Good. Our salvation. 
the only way we could be saved. Now we've considered these uh, awful things that happened to Job, and, and we see how evil still exists in a sin-cursed world, and we've looked at why a sovereign God would allow it to happen. Now I want us to see quickly um, the response of Job in all of this pain and loss. Verse number 20 of chapter 1. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. These are the words of one who had it all. He was on the mountain top. And he lost it all in what possibly could be 15 minutes. Everything. Everything. And yet, number one, we see that he wasn't bitter. He wasn't heartless. He rent his mantle. He was sad. He shaved his head. He, he, he was bent over. He fell on the ground. He was heartbroken. But he says... Okay, I, I, I lost everything. It wasn't mine to begin with. It was God's. He can take it. He can give it. Let me say that pain and suffering in your life will either move you toward God or away from God. It will either break your back or bend your knee. It will move you. Pain moves you. You know, we naturally want God to take us out of the fire, take us out of the flood, take us out of this trial. But sometimes he, he, he chooses to walk in the flames with us, like the three Hebrew children. Isaiah chapter 43 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, and they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flames kindle upon thee. Jesus is not to blame in our trials. He's our only hope in our trials. We won't be able to get through them if we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ. A little later on in Isaiah 53, it says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He is the ultimate answer for dealing with our problems. He is the ultimate counselor because he's been through anything we could ever go through. Don't you want to go through someone to someone who went through it and, and came out on top? I just don't understand these people who are going through a divorce and they go to somebody who's divorced. I don't understand that. Well, what are you going to get from them? A pat on the back? Go to somebody who can help you because he went through it and he won. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. That's where he is. Turn over to chap uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And uh, Hebrews says this in such a victorious way. It's, it's, it's the same thing, only in such a tone of victory. And, and the message of Hebrews, the message of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4. But the message of the book of Hebrews is it doesn't get any better than Jesus. That's what Hebrews is all about. It doesn't get any better than Jesus. He's the answer to your needs. He's better than anyone else. He's better than anyone who ever lived. He's better than the old covenant. He's better than the law. He's better than the sacrifice uh, system. He, he's better than the old priest, uh, priesthood. He's the best you can get. Go to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy... And find grace to help in time of need. When you're praying to Jesus, sure, he's the son of God. Sure, he's on the throne. Sure, he is high and lifted up. 
Sure, he is the great high priest, but he's more than that. He's the one who can relate to you right now because he's been through it all. And he wants to give you mercy and he wants to give you grace. There is nobody that understands your suffering like Jesus. He knows suffering. He left heaven's comfort to come as the God-man to earth. And he was rejected. He knows rejection. He knows misunderstanding. He knows about rumors and lies. He, he knows about betrayal. He knows about uh, physical suffering. He knows about humiliating death. There is nothing you can go through that he doesn't already know because he's been there and lower. You know, there's countless stories of those who, who have died without Christ and cursed God and died and, 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 and they've claimed with their dying breath, if, if God is real, I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to make these demands. And they died without hope. And there are countless other stories of those who died as martyrs and found that Christ was everything they ever needed. Amen. Acts chapter 7 tells the story of Stephen. And you know, this is a, a remarkable story, the first martyr. Uh, Stephen, we have the, the story of Stephen and he is preaching and they, they are so angry. It says they're gnashing on him with their teeth. And they pick up stones and they start, uh, they, 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 they start uh, throwing stones at him. And amazingly, in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 55, we see that, that, that Stephen says nothing about the pain. He says nothing about the stones hitting his head and his body and, and beating him, battering him to death. He says nothing about that. He says that he saw Jesus. And that was all he needed. It says that he, he, he says, uh, he being full of the Holy Ghost looks up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God. All of the time that he's doing this, stones are pummeling his body and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see heavens open and the son of man standing on the right hand of God. Jesus was all he needed for his suffering. Grace was a sufficient. And there's some of us here that are going through some suffering that nobody knows but God. Nobody knows but God. Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I challenge you and I challenge myself to do the same thing. It is not an easy thing to say, but it's the only right statement. Even if you could get all the answers to all the questions, to all the problems uh, and, and uh, all of the losses in your life and somehow intellectually figure it out and, and come to a satisfying conclusion, it wouldn't help you with the emotional hurt. But there is one who is waiting, one who Job knew and trusted, one who went through everything you're experiencing and came out without sin, and he's waiting to give you hope. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. You are our blessed hope. Lord, without you, we cannot go through hard times. And Lord, I pray that each one here won't go through that without you. There's no one that understands our hurts and our needs more than you. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would meet us right exactly where we are. And if it's not your will to remove us from the pain... We pray that you'll hold our hand and walk through it with us. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe you're here this morning and the Lord has touched your heart and you'd say, 
by God's grace and through his strength, I'm not going to give in to the fears and the doubts of the devil. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to bless his name. While your hearts are tender this morning, will you just kneel before the Lord and tell him, Lord, I'm going to bless your name. Whatever you choose to allow me to go through, help me to see your blessed face and not the face of that wretched devil. Maybe you've here and you've heard that the Bible says you can be sure you're saved and on your way to heaven, but you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. Maybe you're here and you'd say, I don't know that I'm saved, but I want to know for sure today. I want you to, I, I want you to show me from the scripture how the, the Lord tells us that you can be saved today and know it. You don't know when your time will be. You don't know. Every one of those people in the Twin Towers didn't know their day would be today when they went to work. Do you know for sure this morning you're saved and on your way to heaven? Is that you? Would you like us to show you from the word of God? Would you just raise your hand and say, I, I don't know, but I want to know before I leave here today. I want somebody to take the word of God and show me. The church is a spiritual ho hospital. We're here to help. If there's anything that we could do, that we're able to do, to help you with some spiritual question, show you in the Bible the answer. If you've been saved and never baptized and want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, we want to help you with that. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the hope that you give to our lives. Lord, may we not leave without you. May we take you everywhere everywhere we go. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your hymnals this morning, if you will. Number 306, 302. Three hundred two. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Stand with me, if you will. We'll sing verses, uh, just verse number one. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Three o two. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but His love abideth ever through eternal years. The same. For the height and depth of mercy, for the length and breadth of love, oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life above. Amen. Brother Don, will you close us in prayer? Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. We'll meet again at 6 o'clock tonight. Lord willing, we'll see you there.